Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Kendra Sakamoto, and I'm one of the librarians here at the West Vancouver Memorial Library. Um, I do recognize today that we are all in different places. I would like to acknowledge that the library sits on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Squamish Nation, the tsleil Nation, and the Musqueam Nation. Um, today, May 5th, is Red Dress Day, which is the National Day of Awareness for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls, and Two-Spirit People. Um, it is really important to commemorate this day and to think about what role we play in this ongoing crisis. And if anyone is interested in learning more about Red Dress Day, we have lots and lots of resources at the library. Um, today, I'm really delighted to welcome Laura Marie Newbert. Laura Marie is a West Vancouver-based urban permaculture designer, a writer, a photographer, and an edu documentary filmmaker. Her really fantastic Garden to Table column appears regularly in the North Shore News. You can make sure to check that out. Welcome, Laura Marie. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here with me. I'm very excited to talk to you today about um, what I realized is a very complicated subject. I think I might have bit, bitten off more than I can chew with this one, but bear with me. Um, so I'm sure everybody can see my screen here. Um, I I chose this image of what looks like a little weed, but it's actually a, it is a, a native nodding onion that has taken root in our back patio. And after this crazy couple of years that we've had, it just struck me as it was like a symbol of resilience. And I thought it gave me pause and made me think about the things that we can do to try and manage climate change. Um, so I thought I'd start off just with some photos of what we may all have been seeing in our gardens this spring after that last massive cold snap, I think it was in March. Um, I'm sure some of this looks familiar to you. I've had many emails from people asking about the laurels. And out here where we live in West Van, we were we're up the mountain a bit and we we were below 20 with ferocious Arctic winds. And um, for the first time in my lifetime that I can recall seeing the laurels, uh, which are bulletproof normally, um, <coughs> we're suffering from defoliation. And um, <clears throat> you can see in the top two photos, two sides of the same um, piece of hedge in our yard. One side was windward and the other side was uh, a, was protected from the wind. And you can just see the damage that was done. And it's just all over the North Shore. You see this. I mean, the, the hedges are coming back and you, we, once we trim them, they'll they'll survive. But it was it was just um, so drastic this year. And then also um, on the, the the bottom here, we have this um, evergreen clematis that uh, may be dead. It circles our entire home. Um, there are other, uh, other vines also entangled in it in different places, but that's taken 23 years to grow. And uh, it might've uh, might have packed it in with this last cold snap. And then um, there's a, a blueberry, potted blueberry there that um, started, you know, being very happy in the spring in the, in March and it's set into bud and then got decimated with that last cold snap. So what these things all have in common is they're not native. In this next slide, we're looking at some very different things. We have, um, a, uh, beach strawberry, native beach strawberry in its third year growing in some little cracks in our patio. And I, I just think it's lovely. Year one, year two, and year three left to right on the top left, you can see how it's just migrating. And I think it's so beautiful and tough. And then in the center top, we can see some tiny wee little um, lavenders pop popping up through the mulch in the front garden. And below that, we can see a, a longer view of that same nodding onion. And to the left, some native um, red leaf sorrel or bloody dock growing up out of the mulch, the stone mulch. And then on, on the right, there's a hascap that was um, given to me in, I think it was just before the cold snap. I drove that home from Chilliwack in, uh, it was bare root, two bare root plants, freezing ice storm. I was driving home through at 110 kilometers an hour for an hour and a half, two hours. 
and I didn't think it had a hope of surviving. And I stuck it in this planter with some um, living soil and voila. You can see the little in the inset photo, those are little hascap berries. What these plants all have in common is that they're native. They're native to Canada, they're native to the Pacific Northwest, they're native to cold. So that's a clue. So um, just in kind of broad strokes about climate change, I've been doing a lot of research and speaking with people and what plant pathologists seem to ha think happened is that this has been a three year long process that began with the major heat dome of 2021. And it was a first major stressor on plants and ecosystems, especially those that are not native. Um, plants, whether we knew it or not, entered a low energy state where they were processing less carbon dioxide and resulting in less carbohydrates moving through their roots and leading to lower absorption, absorption of nutrients and water. And, you know, this cascade can lead to root death. It could take months or even years. So you may never know what ultimately caused where, where, the, where it began, but you'll certainly know where it ends. And uh, we're being advised that subsequent extreme hot and cold weather events will just exasperate, exacerbate these stressors. So I thought I'd start out by just talking about coping strategies because everything else for the next hour is going to illustrate these things, but I don't want to speak to them as we see them. If I give you all of the strategies and I can relate back to them as we go through. So these are favorite ones. Some are mine, some are not, some are expert. I've, I've spoken to so many people in different parts of North America, and this is kind of the list. Um, native plants, that's at the top of the list, of course. They Native plants are native to our landscape and even uh, extreme weather conditions. So they will do better during um, extreme weather events. Employ no-dig principles, no-till, no, till, no dig. Uh, don't turn the earth over, don't disturb the mycelial network, don't release the trap carbon. Um, third is mulch, mulch, and keep mulching. Mulch with living biomass and you're just building soil. Um, water less and more deeply. And when you water water when it's not not warm or sunny or extremely uh, have an extreme temperature, water in the morning and um, before there's any, any any temperature pressure on the plants. Create uh, windbreaks and hedgerows when you can to shelter um, some existing non-natives, but also when you see changes in your environment, for perhaps there's development going on and trees come down and suddenly you're exposed, which happened to us. Um, we had to create some windbreaks um, on our property, which I'll show you later. And one thing I learned from experience was to keep the, sh um, the fruit and nut tree roots in the shade. Because uh, if you get an extreme warm event in the spring and the roots get warm, your trees can set into bud and then a cold event will kill the buds and there you go. Um, use and sustain living soil. That is, soil biology is the most important thing. Uh, just like our own internal biology, um, soil is a living, breathing thing and keeping that soil alive. Um, if you don't have living soil, start and then maintain its, its health. Um, building hugel culture beds and mounds, we'll, we'll learn about what that is. That's a very, very good strategy, a very old strategy. And of course, um, use fleece to protect from cold and insect predation. And insect predation is, is a moving target. As the climate changes, we see bugs and bees and birds that we're not used to seeing or at different times of the year. So just be aware and, you know, use your fleece and just, you know, recycle it. Um, something I've been doing lately, and this is a really good strategy, is adding wool pellets um, or hemp. Um, hemp is uh, like hemp is, uh, well, from hemp plants. There's a huge hemp industry in, in uh, Canada, particularly Western Canada. And a byproduct is hemp. Um, it's kind of like, it looks like straw, but it's made from hemp. And it's a really great uh, to amend with your uh, into your soil and it helps um, hold, it creates porosity, it helps hold water and it breaks down into um, a whole host of beneficial micronutrients. And wool pellets, wool pellets are tiny little, they look like little capsules made from the dirty, um, non-usable, usually belly wool from sheep when they're shorn. And they contain all kinds of um, manure, um, manure, uh, fertilizer 
And they also, so they expand in the soil or you can like pull them apart a little bit, um, mix them in with your soil and uh, they will slowly re re release nitrogen over time and they will help um, hold water. I used to use cut up old sweat, wool sweaters. Actually that works too, but they, they don't have the, the nutrients. Um, I understand about not watering lawn, but I'm not a big fan of dead grass because that means in all likelihood, the soil underneath is also dead because it's not being watered. And um, even when rain falls on dead grass, it, it runs away. I know people will hate me for saying that, but um, it's not a good look and it's not a good idea. So when you can replace the grass with something else. On that note, cover bare soil with cover crops and mulches, which we'll go into in detail. Um, I already talked about developmental impacts. Just keep an eye on your microclimate and see what happens. You know, when trees come down, when paving goes in, when a big house goes up, house comes down, our microclimate changes every time there's a, a small change in our immediate vicinity. Um, do not use non-organic inputs. Of course, that goes without saying. Chemical and synthetic fertilizers are not good for plants or not good for people. And try and buy heritage seeds uh, from Canadian companies. There are some fantastic companies um, in our colder markets and the Maritimes and in um, Winnipeg that offer an amazing variety of heritage seeds that are very resilient and very nutrient and produce very nutrient dense food. Um, install drip irrigation if you can. Um, you know, uh, drip irrigation feeds at a rate of around, I think it's one gallon per hour, uh, slowly in a very particular pattern. And it um, trains roots to, it trains roots to go deep and it, it's just a much more efficient way of using, uh, of delivering water. Um, diversify plantings. So anti-monocrop. Do polycropping. We'll get into that later. Create wildlife habitat, um, not just for the sake of habitat, but because um, creatures um, contribute to the ecosystem. They fertilize, they move seeds, they they irrigate, they dig. Um, they're, you know, it, it's uh, important to create habitat to support, support um, endangered pollinators and birds also. Vermicompost in situ, if you can. I do, I have in bed vermicompost in all my raised beds. And I'm, I'll talk about a new, a new larger system that I'm creating. Um, the very best fertilizer made, God made, whoever made is um, worm poop. And if you can keep those worms happy and pooping in your beds, well, there you go. Um, create a, little, a local network of people you can trust, people you can ask, people that are interested in the same things you're interested in. It's invaluable to me. I'll share some of my um, primary contacts later. Um, this goes without saying, I suppose, but I can't believe that people are still doing this, um, not doing this. Um, transplant, transplant potted, you know, substantial plants and trees in spring and fall, um, not in the heat, not in the extreme cold. Um, create garden rain gardens when you can. And now with major storm events, um, more and more people are, being faced with all this incredible runoff and it's damaging property, damaging gardens. And it's pretty easy to create a rain garden. I'll show you one that we did. Um, stacking plant types and root systems is great. It's, it's, you know, a food forest is stacking plant types, but root systems too. If you get spreading roots, compact roots, tap roots, all kinds of different roots, some that degrade over the winter, some that don't, it helps keep the soil alive and keeps water cycling through it. Um, now mulching for winter, that's a little bit different. I call it deep and diverse and we'll go into what that means, but that's a very, very good strategy. It saved our beds this winter. Employ hotbed strategies, which I'll talk about also. It's a very old fashioned thing to do. Um, mimic nature whenever you can in restoring, restoring an ecosystem. And I'll talk about one that we did, um, just two years ago. Stockpile your natural assets. That means whatever you, whatever waste product you create in your garden, keep it. You're going to use it somewhere. And then the first and last rule, an ongoing, enduring daily, every minute by minute rule of um, permaculture, urban or otherwise, is observe and interact. And that applies to human health too, not just uh, plant health. Okay. So 
just to recap what permaculture and ur urban permaculture are, um, any of you have seen my presentations before you've seen this slide. Um, permaculture is three people, three overarching principles, people care, earth care, fair share. Those are pretty self-explanatory -exp and there are 12 overarching rules. Um, it was founded, the per term permaculture, permanent agriculture or perennial agriculture was termed in 1978 by um, two very academic um, uh, fellows, Bill Mollison and his uh, student, David Hol Holmgren. And um, David Holmgren is still like the godfather of, of permaculture. And basically what it is, it's a, a design system for sustainable living and land use that adheres to natural logic. I would actually say regenerative living and land use. Um, now, I think they probably would too if they had to redo it. But basically, it is a um, it is a way of of being and thinking, living and interacting with the world that I believe could you know save the planet and people. Urban permaculture, which is kind of where I've gone with my because I live in the city and I love the ethos, um, most of it of permaculture, but I'm not, uh, I like things to be a little bit more, let's say pretty maybe, and um, even and balanced and uh, classical, I guess. I believe that urban permaculture is a way forward for the masses. It embraces the ethos and ethics of rural permaculture, but it's, you know, more bendy and, it offers something for everyone. You can interpret and, and change things as you need to. And it's as much art and intuition as it is science and stricture. It's totally based on resilience. And one thing I always say, I tell people when they say, oh, it's so hard to do this, or I can't do it. I have, you know, this or that and the other thing. I just say, do your best, you know, imagine and implement as many principles as you can and are permitted to do to live beautifully and righteously and sustainably and now, because I've just gone so far down this rabbit, rabbit hole of the connection or the interconnectedness of all things, whole systems thinking with plants and whole systems thinking with human health, I would add, you would want to increase both your lifespan and your health span. So you not only want to live longer, but you want to have a good life. You don't want to spend the last 25 years in a wheelchair or because you haven't looked after your health or in chronic disease. And uh, I know it's incredibly complicated. I was just talking to Kendra about that. But, you know, there are so many similarities. And having gone down this road of educating, of education, re-education since 2018, 2019, and my own health journey, I can tell you that, you know, the rules aren't that much different for, for soil and plants as they are for people. Um, so quick recap, urban permaculture. On the left, urban permaculture. On the right, or sorry, on the left, rural permaculture, on the right, uh, urban permaculture. Typically built zones are built out from you in the middle in concentric cir circles based on land use. And had we had a little parcel of land when we moved to West Van, we would have done that. But because we didn't, our zones ended up being all wiggly and weird, but that's okay. You know, we do your best. I've reduced the 12 principles down to just a couple of basic ideas about, about doing your best. Learn, garden organically, design intuitively, don't do anything that doesn't work and waste nothing. And the short list of principles are mimic nature, conserve and store resources, create habitat and biodiversity, don't dig and create a harvest and harvest food, harvest medicine and waste nothing. So quickly again, some of you have seen this already. This was our situation in 2019. This was around COVID time. I had spent the last couple of years on a personal health journey. I'd gone back to school. I was very informed and motivated to make some changes. <coughs> Excuse me. And I was realizing the differences or the similarities and in interconnectedness of all things, as I mentioned before. So, you know, kind of typical West Van you know, family front yard. Um, it had been surrounded with trees. It was such a beautiful, lovely shaded, lots of trees and bees and things. And then development started, which you can see in the background all around us. 
And I thought, okay, this isn't good. We're starting to get a lot of wind from trees coming down, no privacy. Uh, what are we going to do? Uh, so I wanted to, you know, build an eco, like a paradise. It was my idea. And we had a large level lot. It was in good shape. Um, I hadn't put any chemicals on it at all. So there was lots of worms. There's good soil biology, good drainage. We had some mature trees behind where I'm standing. We had some established hedges, a greenhouse, and we had in-ground irrigation, which was broadcast irrigation, 14 zones, a lot of waste, not a great system, but it was there. And you can see at the, uh, the inset bottom right, that is an aerial view from Google Earth from that time, 2019. So my daughter and I started, uh, you know, building, designing a little area or little boxes where this was going to go, where that was going to go, where a hedge was going to go, or sorry, a trellis was going to go, raised beds were going to go. And um, we did what we could with the materials we could get during the beginning of COVID. And five years, five years, five months later, looked pretty nice. And uh, it, you can tell it's new. You know, um, we made some mistakes. And experienced gardeners will see those in this picture. We were doing our best. And you can see in the aerial inset that, you know, it's quite different from this bottom right photo. It's a fairly major difference in just five months. And then, uh, so we we worked on that. We um, had, a, no, we had nine beds, a tiny fruit and nut orchard, food forest. We started converting the lawn from lawn to bee turf. We put in some windbreaks. We put in the in-ground composting. We established some native planting. We created pollinator habitat and we were producing food um, 12 months of the year. Well, not in August, but year to date. And then these are this is how it looked. A little a different little areas you can see. It's quite nice. And some more views. The raised beds. This is during a fire season, so it's pretty smoky. There's a herb spiral. It's quite beautiful. And soil health was really good. You can see by the mushrooms growing up in the compost, vermicompost. And then in uh, here we are in August 2022. And you can see that we have, if you, if you look at the top left photo, that's August 2021. So that's one year after our initial installation and we'd you know things had gotten bigger the plants had gotten bigger but we still had this um boulevard ravaged boulevard grass that was doing nothing and we, it wasn't being watered and it uh didn't look good it wasn't doing anything for soil biology so we were inspired to create a couple of boulevard ecosystems um and you and we were in well, where'd it go here hang on a sec i'll go back um a couple of boulevard ecosystems. One is a woodland ecosystem, and you can see on the far left under a big Austrian black pine. And in the center of the image, those three trees, those are Gary Oaks, which is considered a keystone species. And we created um, a very uh, comprehensive Gary Oak ecosystem or the beginnings of one. And um, yeah, it's just gone beautifully and it's, it's beautiful. And the water cycling, the, everything in the ER, everything in our entire property is working better because we have almost like a, a com the beginnings at least of a complete system. So here, um, this was August 22. So that was two years now after the original install. And you can see the yard is growing in, the vines and the um, trellis are growing, the windbreak is getting better. And then we have August 22. 23 no, that was 22 sorry august 2023 and you can see it's just it's much more less mu much more lush it's really growing in so now we have in 2023 which was three years on we have a really good soil management program we have expanded our fruit and nut tree orchard we have a really good native mulch program i'll explain that we've been adding to our lawn conversion by adding paths and some i would say kind of hardwood flooring in patches here and there. And our my goal is to get rid of all of the lawn, but it is something that um, we can't do all at once for all kinds of different reasons, not the least of which is financial, but we're getting to it. Um, we've installed permeable borders and paths to keep rain in place, any kind of water. 
We've uh, really learned a lot after three years, our pest management, our bio pest management program is working really well. And you know, it seems to be touch wood. Um, I don't really need to do much. It looks after itself. Uh, we created a, a beetle habitat, which I'll show you, which is a little bit of a beetle mound. Um, and that was really important to our pest management program. Um, optimized the vermicomposting, we added to that. We created the new Boulevard ecosystems. We added a Hugo culture garden, which is a German system of, uh, it's a really cool system of mounding biomass and create little heated garden space. We expanded our native bee population because we were noticing a decline in, uh, in the European honeybee and just bees generally with these extreme heat events. I think it was in 2023, it was in the spring, it was really apparent. And native bees populate at 80 times the rate of European honeybees and they're native. So they're, they are a far more resilient creature. We also installed um, over time, 4,000 linear feet of drip irrigation. And um, I did a lot of that myself and it's a lot of work. Um, but also Charles from Mamquam Irrigation was awesome in helping me figure out how to change the pop-ups. I mean, he did it, honestly. I just kind of buried it for him. But it's a, a lot of work, but man, it is such a good, it's a great system. And other than the little bits of remaining lawn, everything on the property, every single part of the garden is fed by drip and it's much more efficient. We created a, a stormwater rain garden. And then earlier this year, we added a shiitake and wine cap garden, mushroom garden. We had a chicken coop and run, which has been a lot of fun. And we... Wanted to do a keyhole compost, but didn't have the resources or space. And I was a little bit worried about predators. So we've just designed a modified keyhole to see how that works. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. I was just down in, <clears throat> if any of you have ever heard of Polyface Farm in rural Virginia, where Joe Salatin has his amazing regenerative farm. I was down there just a few weeks ago visiting and it was so cold. I got this cold. I'm sorry about my voice. Okay, so to the point of this whole discussion, um, I want to go back to something called, this isn't my term, I didn't make this up, um, a very renowned functional medicine doctor, um, called, her name, Mark Hyman, coined the phrase symbiotic phytoadaptation, which really means people and plants evolve together and are, in, are independent on each other, which is obvious. But also um, if the system, either system is broken, the systems don't work. And there's such a, um, a correlation between human and planetary health and soil biology. And that's what we're talking about. So just to kind of speak about that whole system thinking as it relates to the planet, which would be permaculture. Um, permaculture is a design system for sustainable living and land use that adheres to natural logic. We talked about that. It is science-based. It's informed by traditional knowledge. It observes and interacts. It's rooted in microbiome and it is regenerative. Those exact same principles apply to whole body systems or functional medicine, um, it is, which is a systems biology based approach that focuses on identifying and addressing the root cause of disease. And it depends on these exact same things. It is science based, it's informed by traditional knowledge, it observes and interacts, it doesn't just treat, it treats, observes, modifies, it's rooted in the microbiome, and it is regenerative. So, um, this next slide and the one after that are the only complicated ones, but I just wanna gloss over them just so you have a kind of baseline idea of how are things connected if you don't already. So the food system that I saw, the broken food system that I'm talking about, or that I, I guess forgot to mention here, whole systems thinking, farming and living can repair our broken food system, clearly. Industrial agriculture, and this is a generalization, and I'm hoping I'm not going to get a bunch of hate mail for generalizing, but you have to generalize. Um, in general, industrial agriculture is an intensive macro level 
agriculture or farming of monoculture crops most often, uses tillage and heavy equipment, chemical and synthetic inputs, and it's centralized distribution and storage and involves long haul shipping. That's kind of where our food system has gone. We, we're, we've gone away from the small farms and uh, family farms, community farms, backyard farms, city gardens, and we've moved into these centralized, you know, huge systems that don't that are not regenerative. And we know that they consume fossil fuel, water, and topsoil at unsustainable rates. We know that um, use of chemicals and tillage destroys the soil microbiome and the mycelial network, which is like the internet of things below the soil. We know that tilling releases soil borne carbon into the atmosphere. It is the largest, arguably, um, cause of atmospheric carbon, along with fossil fuel and I guess CAFO farming. I could have that slightly wrong, but it's major. Allows wind and water runoff of soil and chemicals into the waterways and oceans, creating algae blooms, coral death, species loss, loss and a rise in temperature. It reduces our local uh, food and seed security and resilience and creates food deserts. Um, it runs counter to the regenerative model that sequesters carbon, increases soil, plant, animal and human health, integrates pastured animals and helps regular, uh, regulate weather systems. And this industrial agriculture together with the proliferation of processed food and Franken food um, there is a direct correlation between these things and the unprecedented increase in chronic disease in humans, particularly children, decreased fertility, health span, and lifespan. So that's the complicated piece. This looks complicated, but it isn't. Just focus on the dots. I found a cool, not new article in a journal of International Society of Microbial Ecology from 2015, actually, comparing... Um, it, I think the study was called Cross Kingdom, um, something in uh, my little window has covered that up, so I can't quite read it. But it, it, com it talks about the similarities um, between the human gut and the plant rhizosphere, which is the plant root zone, uh, root zone or the human gut biome and the plant, gut, uh, plant root biome. And basically, um, what we know is that both biomes are dependent on probiotics, which are living microbes, beneficial microbes, prebiotics, which are the foods that feed those microbes, and postbiotics, which are beneficial compounds that are produced by the microbes. Um, sometimes they're referred to as um, metabolites. If these things are working well, we have homeostasis or good health. The system is in balance. If they're not, we end up with dysbiosis, we end up with chronic illness, over, like it's all scaled over time. We end up with um, dead soil. Um, and we know that humans and plants exchange microbes for better or for worse. And that's all you really need to know. I leave this here because I know that um, this slide show will be saved and people can refer back to it. I've excerpt, excerpted from the study. And uh, if you take some time to read this, it's like stupid simple, what's really going on here? We just need to uh, be healthy by keeping our soil healthy. And um, by keeping our so soil healthy, we can mitigate the effects of climate change. Okay, this is the soil microbiome. All you need to know here is that in one teaspoon of healthy soil, you can, there will be up to 1 billion microbes and we need those microbes to be healthy. We need them to exist in the first place. We need them because our food eats them. Then we eat our food and we are healthy. If we don't have them, our food doesn't eat them. We eat dead food and we are not healthy. So knowing all of this, what do we do? And how do we build resilience at home? Okay, all that was the complicated part. No, it's fine. Um, so the first principle of permaculture is the first, middle, and last principle. Observe and interact. Watch what's going on, modify, observe, and adjust, just like you do in medicine, or functional medicine anyway. Manage your ecosystem services. We talked a little bit about that. Manage your inputs and your output, the temperature and rest, just like with people. Keep the ground covered. Keep your soil biology healthy. 
create shade by layering, create windbreaks, control erosion. I've talked about all of this. Optimize for human and ecos uh, ecosystem health in tandem by buying local seeds, um, focus on heritage and, um, and native foods, um, and save seeds when you can. So here are a couple of images of what's going on in the garden recently. Examples of creating resilience. On the far left, we can see some native bee homes. These are just a few of, these are the primary kind of demonstration homes, but native bees nest all over our property, all over the place. In the in the center bottom shot there, we see Dave, our little dog, um, walking down a, the trellis pathway. All along the left, those are um, Heath Alba, which are um, food. Um, they bloom October through May. It is food for the native bees. That's one of the food sources we have on the property and they were planted just for them. And they also nest in the hedge. So as soon as they hatch, they have something to eat. Um, there's, um, there's the, in the top middle, you can see the beetle, uh, the beetle habitat, that little round circle with the native grasses in it. That's beetle habitat that was created because there were beetles missing from our ecosystem and they like to um, live, nest and hide in uh, native grasses. So that that's actually working and I've seen beetles. So it worked almost right away. And um, you can see on the top, top right, there's an example of covering your soil. That is a Mm, not very old, maybe I'm guessing, let's say six month old on the left, transplanted um, addition to our dwarf fruit orchard, completely covered in in uh, living mulch and or mulching compost and then living mulches and native uh, perennial vegetables and some pollinator friendly um, herbs and deep tap rooted, deep tap rooted herbs and plants as well. And you can see a closer closer view of it on the bottom right. Um, there's a potted uh, blueberry, some fruit trees, and then a whole mixture of different things um, in the in the in the garden. And there's some um, locust wood path pavers that you can't really see in there. They're overgrown with the living time or the creeping time. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. And uh, here again is that top left is that um, hanging blueberry someone gave me. It's non-native and uh, sadly it packed it in in March because it started to bloom and then um, in came that cold snap. Uh, top middle we have a perennial bed that is the that is the um, asparagus bed, but it's planted with a whole ver diverse um, array of of perennial vegetables and uh, other perennial vegetables and some um, insect management flowers. There's cosmos in there. Same with the photo below. You can see like all kinds of different uh, levels of planting, very intercrop. The, the soil is covered. Something's just been harvested and I haven't replanted there, but you can see the, um, cre the cascading um, spinach. It's beautiful and edible. And then you've got layering up right up on two different beds, right up to the food forest. So it's creating a nice windbreak and extra heat for the more heat loving plants in the front. And then on the bottom left, there is this kind of side view of those same two gardens. You can see there are Calette on the right, just one. There's just one Calette hidden by um, non brassicas so that there was no pest pressure at all. Not one little tiny bug in that plant. And it was there all summer, right? Actually it was there right through the fall and winter as well. And then on the far right, we've got seed saving going on. Um, I do that. These particular beans that are closest to the camera were, um, I, I received these beans from a friend of mine, Maria Bird. She she gave them to me. Her family has been saving them for over a century at this, um, and they uh, they came from Greece originally and uh, from a, a village that is abandoned now. And it was such a treat to get them. I had 100% pollination and almost nothing could kill these beans. Uh, they, they were, you could see them in the, growing on the trellises on the trellis in the middle photo. Uh, another view of the trellis. You can see there's all kinds of three different kinds of hops growing there and together with some flowering plants for pollinators. We were harvesting the hops there in the uh, center top photo. We use the hops for tea and for making beer. 
um, another ver another view of the kind of, uh, it's really hard to now see the different areas of the garden because it's grown in just like a forest. But as you're walking through it, it's clearly corridored. It's like all these beautiful interconnected garden rooms, but it's not as open, which is really good for the garden. It's really good for the soil. It keeps moisture in place. And even the grass gets a lot of dew on it, what grass is left um, because of this. It's not just left wide open. Um, that same bottom right, that's a really pretty, very early view of a garden bed, which is also stacked. The um, um, plants in the front are getting much more sun and um, the ones in the back are northern exposure peas in this case. I think they were peas, uh, king tut peas, um, really enjoying the cool. And then you have a, a lovely shot of the fruit. One of the, that's I think a plum, um, a plum tree surrounded by every everything it needs, beneficial flowers, all kinds of mulches. Um, we had no pest pressure at all on any of our 18 dwarf fruit trees just year three into the program because of all of the, the, um, the habitat for all of the um, uh, insects, predator insects eating the, the, no, the insects are being eaten by other insects. The insects that would eat my plants are being eaten by other insects. Alrighty. And here we have something pretty cool. Um, the top two photos are the inside and outside view of some vines that surround our home. Um, we have a mixture of different vines. In this case, this are honeysuckle, which in the summer shade and cool the house really beautifully. Uh, and in the winter, they drop their leaves and the lower sun is then allowed to warm the house. So we don't need AC. It, it's a perfect system. On the south side, the that's kind of southeast. On the direct south side, we have a, a kitchen, like a covered patio area. And that's where we grow tomatoes in containers right up to the eaves. And those tomatoes, as the weather gets warmer, end up providing absolute shade for the inside. And you can see on the far right what it looks like through, I think that's the bathroom, oops, sorry, a bathroom window. Um, and it's really pretty and we get a lot of food. And those, because it's in a heat sink, it's covered and it's getting reflected heat off of the patio, uh, which is a really great... Um, if, if you have a covered space, even if it's over a doorway, that's a really good place to cheat and create a separate, warmer, reflected heat environment, um, especially as with extreme weather events. It's a, it's, it's a really good system. And we, we get tomatoes right way past last frost or first frost, so into early November, sometimes late November. Um, uh, ecosystem service services is something I touched on earlier, and it's really important to have um, assets at your disposal and just manage whatever you produce on the property. And that's everything. So on the left, uh, that little bucket is just vegetable wash water. I'd harvested some radishes and I washed them in the bucket and um, I will um, use the wash water in different places in the garden. I just go from bed to bed and I put the nutrients, which I work so hard to produce that are full of delicious worm poop compost tea back into the environment. So you just keep cycling nutrients and that builds resilience with your plants, it builds resilience with your food. You get in, then you eat the food and you are more resilient. It's all native. It's all based on your native ecosystem. And the tops, the top, you can see the fallen leaves from the hops. And this is might maybe September. I leave them until they dry, and then I lightly rake them into um, a trash can. I, I have these cans, lidded trash cans, all over the property. I think they're actually quite lovely. Some people hate them. I think they're pretty. I don't want plastic anywhere. So uh, these galvanized metal um, um, tins are are creature proof and uh, very sturdy. And they're labeled, and so I keep leaves. I keep um, I keep leaves, chopped straw. I keep hemp. I keep spent dirt. I keep um, um, hmm, what else? I keep sand. Um, sometimes vermicompost if I have some extra in little containers all over the place. So I'm not running around, and it's just convenient. And there's all kinds of containers everywhere, so I can mix something up in a pinch. 
And then of course my Rona buckets, I had to take this picture because these are my like trademark buckets. I'm all of, I built our urban farm using these buckets full of sand, full of gravel, full of living soil. They've been back and forth to Chilliwack, God knows how many times. And, um, you know, I, now I have a used pickup, but before I fit nine of them in the back of my Volkswagen Tiguan and, you know, slowly, slowly, anybody can do it. Okay. So, um, the most important thing you can do to mitigate climate change and extreme weather events, cold and hot, is to keep the soil covered, to optimize water and nutrient cycling, to control pests and habitat, to enrich the microbial and fungal component of the soil, increase the porosity and sequester carbon. So this is like a typical day. I think this might've been 2022 from memory. Um, there is no piece of soil that is not covered with something. And if I can't eat it, then a bug can eat it. And then ultimately that's gonna get into the soil and benefit the food that I do eat. So all of this is important, every single piece. Um, the alyssum is perfect. It's probably the best um, multifunction, uh, you know, a control flower for attracting and deterring um, insects. And sorry, <clears throat> in these beds at any time, you'll have mulching compost, which I get from Tor Terra Flora Soil Works in Chilliwack, clean chopped straw, um, piles and piles and layers of deciduous leaves and, their, and cover crops, including peas and beans, legumes and grains and beneficial flowers. Always many or all of the above probably in, in, in most often several varieties in every garden bed. In perennial and tree beds, again, with the mulching compost, that is like a, a vermicast enriched compost. And on top of that, I will put a living mulch. Maybe it's strawberry, native strawberries, moss, native berries like kinnikinnik, evergreen or perennial herbs, um, deep-rooted, tap-rooted um, plants. Uh, to create, um, sometimes they're permanent, like say a um, horseradish or um, something like that. And sometimes they're like radishes, like I'll plant winter radishes just everywhere, or radishes. I've got them all over any bare soil I could find early this spring. I just threw a bunch of French breakfast radish seeds in there, roughed up the soil a bit, and now everything's green. Uh, which is great. And they will degrade. You know, and if you do that in the fall, they'll die over the winter and they'll just turn into this beautiful mushy slurry that's food for plants. Um, also, um, I use climbers as companion plants and um, beans and peas are a good example of nitrogen fixing climbers, but also you can grow, you can grow food, you can grow squash, you can grow cucumber up, up just about anything. And why not? Because that's what nature does. And you'll end up creating resilience in your soil. And then again, along the margins, living mulches, climbers and beneficials, example being the heath down the path for the bees. Here are some examples. <clears throat> On the far left, that's a little kind of air edge of a rain garden that we created. Um, and that looks like the riparian edge of a, a brook or a stream or a lake, which was the intention. And there we, it's all native plants. There's um, those nodding onions, there's ferns, there's moss. Um, those are uh, locust pavers, they don't degrade. And there's some red leaf sorrel in there and deer fern. And you know, it just, you just leave it. The nodding onion spreads like wildfire and it's just beautiful. Um, as you saw in the opening slide there, there's a more aerial view of um, some uh, backyard, more shady area. You've got the ma a bunch of different kinds of moss. You have uh, wild violets and the the red sorrel. Um, and there's some maidenhair fern, which um, all three of those together, they seem to grow together, but they're also really good for um, our little dog when he's not feeling well. He has tummy upset. He just goes and eats them all together. He knows how much to eat of all of, all of them and he gets better. And uh, it's quite amazing. It's a natural plant medicine. And then on the top right, you can see a vegetable. Uh, it's our neighbor's, actually, it's in our yard, but it belongs, it's lent out to our neighbor kids. And that's um, their vegetable bed. And they've got all kinds of things growing in there in layers. Um, and confusing enough so that predators are confused. 
And then they've got some clean straw mulching it. But over time, in a few weeks, that'll just be covered with vegetables and it'll stay that way right through to the fall. Um, bottom right, that looks like regular soil, but it's actually mulching compost. And that is the vermicast enriched compost, um, living soil mulch combination that I put in the new ecosystem. And that was just, you know, after the first rain, this is what happens. And you know, your soil is happy. It's like fungal dominant. It's like a, it's like a forest. It's lovely. And uh, then we have a strawberry in the center bottom. We have um, alpine strawberries, white and red, planted at the base of a boxwood that I really resented that was established when we moved in and I really resented watering it so I put the strawberries there to cool the soil and hold the moisture in and they're now just creeping across the, the walkway and Dave just loves to eat them and there's I can't remember I think there's 120 plants and the birds and the bees and the butterflies and Dave everybody loves them I get the odd one too and uh speaking of Dave there at the top mid middle here he is um between the berry patch and the um, dwarf tree orchard standing in a little bit of grass um, between just a riot of ground cover. And in front of him, there's a little pathway where there are inset cypress pavers surrounded by thyme plants. And you can see in the bottom left, there's a close up of that, one of those pavers and some thyme that I've harvested. Now I harvest that several times in the season and I just keep it and I either use it for smoking, um, not to smoke like inhale, but for smoking fish or smoking meat, you dry it and you can smoke it, it's lovely. Or um, I'm gonna be incorporating that also into the chicken coop bedding just to keep it nice and fresh. And it's an anti, it's got natural antimicrobial qualities. And the top left, um, that is the base of the extension of the fruit orchard. And they were, when I transplanted some of those trees, they did not do well in transplant. I waited too long. And um, so I'm using them as trellises for a Japanese cucumber for uh, and also for clematis and something else. I can't remember the beans or, or, pe or peas. And um, interestingly, the cherry, which has got the cucumbers on it, completely recovered. I don't know what was magic about doing that, but it's, totally fine now. The tree on the left, which is a small almond, um, it did not make it through this last cold snap, but I didn't expect it to. It was very exposed. So I'll, I'll replace that. In the bottom center photo is, a, and you can see many, many layers of mulch ground cover on the, on both on the ground, on the edge of the raised beds or the other planter boxes at the bottom of the fence in the planter boxes themselves, and then against the fence. You can see layers of, um, we've put sunflowers and beans and tomatoes growing up on the trellises and the beans are actually scaling the sunflower. And the sunflowers all lost their heads um, because that is a squirrel highway. Um, I don't know what I was thinking in putting the sunflowers there, but I won't be doing that again. Um, and here is an example of a winter mulch program. So this was, I believe it was October, um, just before the first hard frost, maybe around 20th, something like that. Um, typically in the winter, I have cold frames that I put on these raised beds, but this last winter I was tired. I thought the beds were tired and we all needed a rest. So I was, I did a bit of an experiment and I called Andrew at Terraflora Soilworks to see if he had any comp, uh, chicken manure and he did, he had some fresh chicken manure, organic chicken manure. So I drove my 40 buckets out there and um, came back with half chicken, organic chicken manure and half pure vermicompost, verm, vermicast, uh, worm castings. And uh, so I scraped back the beds, I removed all the summer clean straw, just gently left anything that was living there. I didn't pull out any plants. Then I added uh, two buckets each of the chicken manure and the vermicasting. Then I put the straw back on and then I added whatever um, leaves happened to be around at the time on the center bottom on the left bottom, I guess. That is the leaves that happened to be around at the time. And then a couple of weeks later when the hard frost hit and the maple lost its leaves, I added those on top also and then watered it all in. Now I would not ever recommend putting raw chicken manure in a planting bed. 
um, because of seminal, there's pathogens that can um, get into the food system. But because this was the fall and I knew it was going to go through the winter, more than enough time for any pathogens to die. And I researched that considerably, but it's up to everybody to do their own research. What I can tell you for sure is that that doing that saved the soil biology in those beds. I um, We have nine raised beds, eight of them I treated this way and one I did not treat. And that was my control, um, my control bed. So we had, we went through several deep, cold and thaw cycles and we're just at about, I think 700 feet or something above sea level. But because of development across the street from us that used to shield us from the mountain winds, we just had ferocious Arctic winds coming down on top of the snow and then sunny days melt and cold and wind. And it was just a, a horrific situation for the gardens. And right and through it all, these beds did not the soil in these beds just you know that the soil thermometer you see on the right goes down about six eight inches maybe not even that much four six inches did not freeze they stayed five degrees above freezing at their coldest while the ground and the control bed froze so you know the biology stayed alive slowed down of course but um interestingly they were like um all of the beds were like um, kind of simmering hotbeds, I would say. Um, a hotbed is a technique used in, uh, it's a very old technique used by market or city market gardens primarily where there was a surplus of manure and they and a lot of people to feed. Um, gardeners developed this system where they would have a like a garden bed and fill it with manure thick, you know, like a foot thick, and then put a a layer of soil or a tray of soil on top of it and use the the heat created by the manure to warm the soil to start start seeds early. And then over time, of course, the manure breaks down and you have good compost. It was a great system and it disappeared until fairly recently. And there's been books written about it. But so this is my little simmering hotbed experiment with winter compost. And it uh, I wrote about it in uh, in Garden to Table in the North Shore News, if you're interested in learning more. Okay. <laughs> oh my god i've already spoken for an hour how's that possible i barely got through this okay i'm gonna keep going for 15 minutes so um native mulch this was an um a program that i developed together with some um friends andrew at terrasora terraflora soil works and christina at uh, organic gardens uh, gardeners pantry in victoria and um we turned our boulevard grass into ecosystems inspired by a book called Nature's Best Hope, where we created a woodland habitat based on an existing Austrian black pine and a gary oak habitat using three uh, gary oaks, which are keystone species, interplanted with um, native species that they are comfortable with. And then we topped it off with native mulch, which was made using um, wood, pine cones, broadleaf evergreens on our property. And I, we mulched about 30 bags of all of this to create enough topsoil to mix with living soil from Andrew. And we put that over the whole mess, like we had taken out the grass. We, Christina came and helped me plan the system. My friend Charles at Mamcoin put drip, converted all of the old irrigation to drip. We covered the whole shebang with Andrew soil and native mulch, which we made, um, put in some wood pavers, planted, put stone pathways in, and five months later, received a National Wildlife Certified Wild ha uh, Wildlife Habitat designation. And now, uh, this last year, you can see it's completely, the ground cover is fully, fully on. And we're growing food for us and for birds, and uh, it's quite amazing. Okay, Hugo culture bed. Um, this is something that you can see it's a little mound ecosystem, looks like a mini food forest. Started out in July, 2021, during that first heat dome. I was so upset about this heat dome. I thought I gotta rip up all the grass. Well, I didn't get very far, but I did this little community of grass in, in our circular driveway. Turned it over, added all kinds of biomass from the property, 
uh, turned over the sod, put brown paper down or cardboard, put some sticks and wood, all kinds of biomass, just stuff I'd been saving. Cause I said, don't waste anything, keep all your biomass. And then wrapped it all or just uh, put some irrigation in, put gobs of living soil on top, wrapped it in brown paper, watered it, put more soil on top of that, planted into it, everything that I had left over, all the little seedlings I left, plants, vegetables, fruit, anything I had, transplanted, transplanted a fuyu persimmon into the middle of it. And, you know, a few months later, how many, four months later, it's like a food forest, so prolific. It just, uh, the heat from the decomposing biomass creates this little oven. And this can be done anywhere. It can be done in a pot. It's amazing. Okay, rain garden. We had um, so much stormwater um, issues with the stormwater with these extreme, with these atmospheric rivers. Our dry well in the backyard um, just became this soupy mess. You can see there on the top middle. And so I thought, well, you know, what am I going to do? It was just killing everything and making a mess. And um, so I created a little rain, rain garden with, um, you can see there in the top right. It's all native. It's uh, riparian plantings, largely. Um, there's there's a nodding onion, there's snowberry, there's um, uh, there's um, horsetail, there's rhubarb, interestingly, on the dry end. And there's um, a high bush cranberry and a little bird bath. And that is one of the busiest places in the garden. We even have amphibians coming to visit, which is I've never seen before on our property. Um, another thing that you can do to help with your overall ecosystem and also your own ecosystem is create a, a mushroom garden. And we, we did that in a place in the corner of our yard that had been identified by Christina, actually, the um, lady who helped me with the boulevard. She said the energy there in that corner was really good for mushrooms. And I didn't do much about it, except now this year, I um, can see in the bottom right, that's the corner under the maple tree and also under some coniferous trees, hemlock and cedar. That area is very conducive to mu growing mushrooms. They just grow there. So um, I got some spent some grow bag medium, spent grow bag medium from Andrew. You can see him there in the top, Terraflora Soil Works. And, and I, I mix that kind of 50-50 with some um, compost, filled these old oak barrels, wine barrels, almost to the top, and then added native, comp native mulch and wood chips, alder wood chips, and, and then put in some spawn for some wine cap mushrooms. And I think what's going to happen, uh, wine caps love um, competing fungi. Most um, mushrooms don't like competing fungi. Um, so I think I'm thinking oysters are going to spread out the cracks of these barrels and I'll for sure get um, wine cap mushrooms growing at the top. Um, I'm, I'm sure of that. And also I've got some mushroom shiitake uh, alder logs there, which have um, in the center photo, those are some that I was harvesting in actually um, New York State at um, Peter Gabriel's mushroom farm uh, near Cornell University. And the ones in the bottom right, you can see are mine. Uh, they were harvested while the sap is still running. It's important to do that. And I just have to drill some holes in the logs, inoculate them with the mushroom spawn, seal them with cheese wax, and then leave them until the mycelial network is established in the logs. And you'll see that at the ends with this little white spider webby kind of cap. And then uh, soak them and uh, they'll, you know, sprout mushrooms. It's pretty cool. And mushrooms are about the, you know, one of the most um, nutritious, nutrient dense things you can eat. Okay, last thing, um, a modified keyhole garden. I didn't have a photograph of a keyhole garden because quite honestly, I haven't seen one that I really love, but I love the idea. Um, I drew this for a client. Um, a passive home in Sioux Valley. And um, so I'm just using it. But basically what it is, it's a, it is, um, it was developed for sub-Saharan Africa as a way to grow food in hot, dry conditions. And it, it's a very big, it's about eight foot wide by maybe five feet high. And it has a little keyhole cut into it that you walk into, lift this lid on a central compost. The whole thing ends up surrounded by soil and um, what it does, it manages your compost. Um, 
manages manages biomass and because there's so much biomass in there it retains the moisture it also manages your green waste man it can manage your gray water manure clippings that's really great for dense plantings not good for root veg though because of the manure but anything that grows up above the soil it's great for squash and peas and beans and all that stuff and like a um, herb spiral it's got about an 18 inch slope so this is a really great, because of the heat, it's kind of like a giant hotbed. It's a really great way to, to you know, grow food all year round. Um, what we did instead of that is we, um, in, the, in the bottom center, you can see um, one of our compromised two by eight beds. Um, this bed wasn't doing well because it was under the, just the outer drip line of, um, of a spruce. And it wasn't doing well at all or it didn't grow much. As you can see in the top scent, this top photo, you can see the, the beds closest to the house that get more sun and more rain and less droppings from the trees. They do well. The one under the tree wasn't doing well. So what I did is sunk these um, six, six gallon galvanized buckets into the soil. They're drilled quarter inch holes all around the sides and the bottom. And they will be used to help manage the um, bedding from the chicken coop. Um, in much the same way that a keyhole garden would. So I will be layering the bedding and garden clippings and things that I wouldn't put in a traditional compost maybe. And, um, and just letting that provide additional moisture to that bed. And then I've, I can plant, I've got these little, you can see little obelisks planted behind them and I can grow like peas or cucumbers or something up there, but we'll see how that goes and see what the predator interest is like. And if it works, then maybe we'll invest in a keyhole garden. Oh, last thing we did from pretty much, pretty much is put in this chicken coop. Um, this picture was taken just a couple of days ago. It's been a mad race um, to get it done. Um, and plantings were an important part of it. We put in this beautiful espalier apple tree, um, which was kind of root bound in a container. And my thinking was that during the summer, it'll provide some shade because this is south facing and then the, keep the help, keep the chickens cool and those plantings along the bottom, which are herbs. There's some wild garlic, some ferns and alyssum um, that'll attract, help attract pollinators to the apple. Um, and then when the apple loses its leaves in the summer, the sun will be able to get through and warm the chickens. So um, also these, um, herbs are going to be helpful in keeping the the microbes in the in the run and in the coop bedding uh levels down so um yeah this is my little chicks our little chicks they got big really fast as you can see those are them in my pantry our pantry and then uh they're up in the coop now you can see in the center top you can see the heat lamp going they've only been in there a few days um, but they're pretty happy. So now what? That was a lot of info. So if you're wondering what to do now, my best advice is just get started in whatever space you have in what, with whatever time you have. And if that's in on a patio or in a pot on a roof deck or just in a journal, just get started. It all matters. And if we all do something, we can really put a dent in, uh, climate change and, you know, help manage our own health and our own gardens, um, you know, use support and invest in organic and regenerative practices. Learn what you can read, read. I've got a, rec a list of recommended reading. You can email me, I'll, I've got hundreds of books. If you wanna borrow them, that's good. Uh, listen to podcasts, as many as you can. I've recommended one. You start with one, it'll lead to others. Believe me, it's like chicken math. Um, and this one is very important. Buy local from farmers markets and CSAs. Ask where your food comes from and vote with your wallet. I ran into a friend of mine from 30 years ago, Herb Barbelay, the other day, and he started Farm Folk City Folk. And I remember him telling me, I think it was 31 years ago, when the first CSA deliveries were just starting to come to the house, he said, you must pay, overpay through the nose for organic bananas. You have to, because only by people doing it will things change. And here we are. Whole Foods sells organic bananas less for less money than conventional bananas. It's the same idea. I tell that story so many times. We just have to start. If you're new to this, one thing I can re recommend, and I hope you do this, I do it. Oops, sorry. Um, I do it. Is there's a um, 
a company on the North Shore called uh, Valley to Shore. It's like a um, a personalized CSA on demand, and it's a great idea which um, puts people in in contact with farmers from the valley. So you can go local farm direct to you without having to go to a farmer's market and you can pick up in Lynn Valley or in Langley. And uh, Dana, who runs it, she offers spray free produce, um, pastured eggs from chickens and ducks, frozen protein, fruit, body, natural body care, flowers and soil supplements, the things you'd find at a farmer's market and you can order online and the prices are re really good. And uh, you can pick up on Tuesdays. Um, so look that up. I, I do it. Even though I grow my own food, I support her and she's got really cool products. So um, it's a good way to learn because she's really in touch with the farmers and she can, when she gives you your broccoli or whatever it is, she'll tell you all about where it came from. And it's part of the learning. So here's some resources for you. we got a couple 15 minutes left for questions, but these are the people I've been talking about. Organic uh, Christina on the island. Andrew at Terraflora in Chilliwack, Charles Irrigation. He's also a water auditor. He can help you solve your water issues. Dana at Valley to Shore, and of course me. Um, you can find me everywhere. You can follow me on Instagram or read my column in the North Shore News. They publish my uh, email address and I get email all the time and I'm super happy to answer it because, because I went... You know, I learned everything I learned the hard way, and I've read thousands of books and articles, and I can maybe help, at least give you an opinion. So um, please be in touch. So I think, oh, here, I forgot about this. Here's some great uh, recommended reading and podcasts. You know, I chose a broad range. These are amazing books and podcasts. If you get through these, you'll have a really great baseline understanding of everything I talked about. And um, it'll just lead you on to the next great thing. So that's it. I'm done. So we have 16 minutes for Q&A. Sorry, I took so long. <laughs> Flew by. Wow. That was a lot of information to get through in a short amount of time. I know. Fantastic. Um, all right. So anyone who has a question, just pop it into the Q&A and uh, we'll have time for Laura Marie to answer them. Um, okay, can you talk more about the beetle setup? Do you need specific plants? Does it need to be on a hill? Um, well, the beetle, ba beetle mound that I uh, did was, it, it's actually typically done in rows. So um, in a farm, in a row crop, typically they'll do a, a crop, a row crop, a beetle crop, beetle hill, like a beetle mound crop, a row, and then another row crop. And it's native grass. That's the deal. You use native grass. Beetles love to live in grass. It's their habitat and leave it um, through the winter and then cut it back in the spring. Uh, so the beetles, they sleep there and they live there and they make babies there and have babies there and everything. Um, and I put it halfway between the edge of my yard and the raised beds so they can scoop from place to place. But I swear to God, like months after it was installed, I saw beetles in my soil and I hadn't seen them. I'm not making that up. It's uh, it's great, and we lost beetles to insect or to insecticide coming from across the street. Um, okay, a question about the Italian beans: Do you or, mm -hmm. do you eat them fresh, or do you dry them and use them later? Both. Eat them when they're tiny. Eat them when they're long, and large, and flat, and then dried. Also, all like peas and beans, you can pretty much do that across the board. Um, I've heard hops can be invasive or spread. Do you have any issues with that? And what is the height of your three types of hops? Yeah, I've heard that too. You know, I don't know where a lot of these things come from. I've heard that they stink. I've heard that they attract rats. I think they smell beautiful. They're beautifully floral, a little bit bitter, and they're growing up an eight foot trellis and they're entirely manageable. Um, everything's invasive if you leave it. But um, the roots are contained somewhat, and I have had no problem at all. And they're Cascadia, um, Golden. Oh, I'd have to, they could email me and I could tell them. I can't remember right now. Um, all right. The living soil you talk about, is that from Terraflora Organics? Yes, it is. Terraflora uh, Soil Works. And there's different grades. There's all kinds of different living soil. 
You can create your own living soil. I, I, I did living soil way before anybody was doing living soil just because it made sense to me to inoculate potting mix with worm castings because the idea of starting food in sterile medium made no sense to me. Um, and so, yeah, I've always done living soil, but Andrew is a soil farmer. He is a soil biology geek and he knows everything about it. He's awesome. Okay. Um, what are the perennial vegetables in with your asparagus? Um, kale, uh, Siberian kale, um, some artichokes, spreading broccoli, um, the leaf, it's like an Italian leaf um, lettuce that grows all year. And what else is in there? I think that's it. Oh, yeah. There's always potatoes that pop up, the purple potatoes. I can never get rid of them. They, one or two of them pop up in there. So they're perennial in that sense. Okay. Uh, do you have tips for protecting apples from squirrels? Our small backyard is a squirrel highway. Mm hmm. I have that problem, too. You know what I found works for us, and I don't know if in a smaller space it'll work, but I have a bait, I have bait apples in the back and it keeps them out of the front. Um, the collars work well too. Like you can get the collars from um, Wild Birds Unlimited and assuming the squirrel can't jump from something onto the tree, it, it, it'll keep them from going up the tree. And that has worked. That has worked for me um, in other situations, but squirrels are part of the ecosystem too. So it's kind of a, you have to, you know, I have a 20% rule. If I get 20%, I'm happy. And I just make sure I have enough of something that I have to stay happy. It's, yeah. It's, it's important to me. It really depends. It's different for everyone. Yeah. Um, and similar question from someone else. How do I stop the squirrels from eating my fruit? Yeah. You know, yeah, so if, it, if it's not it's on it. a tree, what are the tricks? If it's not on a tree? Yeah. Um, well, it would, you mean if the fruit's not on a tree? Yeah, like bush fruit. Oh, yeah, that's tough. Well, um, I don't have any problems with squirrels on my berry, my berries, because my berry patch is surrounded by gooseberry bushes. And gooseberry bushes have really long thorns. And nobody goes near them. They're you know, I've got the elbow length rubber gloves when I'm harvesting. Um, but uh, that's a really good strategy. That's what works for me. The, the um, you know, there are the predator control lights that you can get that work really well after dusk, but they don't work during the day. Um, you know, you can use chicken wire. I mean, it's not beautiful. That's a problem. Um, but I, I found that the predator light Predator lights work really well as long as they're at eye level with whatever predator. You know, I've got those really hokey um, owls. They're plastic owls, mm -hmm. and yeah. their their eyes glow when they they have a little sensor. Their eyes glow and they hoot, and their head spins around. Um, and rubber snakes. It's you know, if I'm going to photograph the garden, I have to move them all. But honestly, they work really well because a uh, root uh, black squirrels are the worst. Gray squirrels not so bad, but black squirrels decimate things. And um, I lost almost all of my squash this last summer, my trellis squash to squirrels. And um, when I put the um, plastic, unfortunately, plastic uh, squirrels and rubber snakes and things, squirrels didn't go near the beds. And they would have because they also eat the leaves, not just the, the squash. So if you can if you can stand the, the kitschy um, owls, they do work. Yeah, that's good to know. Um, right. Any other questions? Make sure to pop them in the Q and A. Um, all right. Where did you get your chicken coop? I actually um, designed it, and because I wanted a lot of space, um, you know, just for six chickens. But um, I uh, there's a place called Mark's Outdoor Furniture in Maple Ridge. And uh, I just found him on Facebook Marketplace. So I, I don't, went out and met with him. He's an elderly fellow, really cool character. And I took the plan to him. It talked about my, what was important. I had to be predator proof. So it's totally lined underground too with the hardware cloth, the quarter inch wire. And um, I, want, I was very particular about what I wanted it to be organic treated, all of this stuff. So he, he built it in pieces and then brought it over and put it together. 
And then I insulated it. I did all the other stuff, which is why I just finished it. I'm not great at that. But yeah, he did a very good job. And I would be, um, I didn't find any kit coop that had, um, in fairness to chickens, uh, what chickens needed. Okay. Interesting. Um, all right. What is your average day like as a practitioner of urban permaculture? And do you continue to work in the garden during the winter? Um, you know what? Um, the, the great thing about permaculture is it does really kick in and start looking after itself. I don't do a lot. I know I, it took a lot of work to get it going, you know, it really did, but, um, I just enjoy it now. And I don't, um, I don't spend a ton of time in the garden, believe it or not. There's so much of it is perennial. It's messy. Everything's interplanted. I don't have to worry about take out a row of carrots. Oh my God, I got to replace that thing. Cause the carrots aren't necessarily in rows. And, um, yeah, I, I love to cook with what I grow um, or what I get from Dana or any other farmer or farmer's market. And uh, the ecosystem is the important thing to me. That's what gives me joy. And um, I love watching the critters out there. Um, I do I do some consulting. I have some clients watching, I think. Um, and I'd love to do that. Um, but, you know, I'm not fanatical about it. I was fanatical about learning about it so I could heal, I could heal my own body and my ecosystem. But um, now that it's done, it's, it's just a treat to witness. Right. Other than the grass. I mean, I can't wait to get rid of that, but <laughs> because it's bee turf, it's like 75% less mowing and watering. Mm -hmm. uh, but when that's done, it's like, it's done. Yeah. Then you can retire, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right. What can I do if I just live in an apartment? Okay. Well, if you have a balcony, you can do a lot. You can, uh, does this person have a balcony? I don't know. Okay. If you want if to um, answer if you have a balcony, just throw that back in the Q and A. If, if they do, then a lot, you could do the bees, the native bee home. You could do, um, a potted fruit tree, like one, like an espalier apple that has one dwarf stalk and maybe three varieties that'll cross pollinate each other. You can underplant it with client. You can plant, you can climb uh, uh, toma or tomatoes or, and, or cucumber or anything up the stalk. You can put herbs and hanging tomatoes. I mean, you can do all kinds of everything that I did. You can do in a small scale in a pot. If you have some sun, just a little bit of sun. You can do the bees. You could do a lot. I've written articles. If you if you look on my blog, on my website, or on the North Shore News, I just did something recently about patio gardening. Um, I can say for myself, so we have a really beautiful um, demonstration garden here at the library that um, mm -hmm. is open for the season, so everyone should come by and check it out. Um, but I was inspired by one of Laura Marie's um, articles about her getting a certified wildlife habitat um, so I went through that process, the Canadian Wildlife Federation, uh, which was really fun. It was a really, it was very simple and it's very affordable. Um, and it was really fun to see what um, our garden is doing really well and where we could make some improvements. Um, and our garden was really focused on insects and bees, but it was really fun to, to go through that process and to just remind you know yourself that the insects are so important as well. Sometimes we think about big wildlife when we talk about wildlife. Even if, you know, like the Gary Oaks, um, apparently they host more insect um, species than pretty much any other coniferous tree. And that's why it's called a keystone oh. species. Yeah. And um, this home, David Tellany, who wrote this um Nature's Best Hope and it founded Homegrown National Park, which is a good resource, suggest planting them because of the endangered birds that they don't, they cannot feed, they can't find enough caterpillars to feed their babies. Mm -hmm. So they're becoming endangered or extinct. So just that one thing, you know, planting a Gary Oak, um, yeah. you know, if, if instead of something else, like, why not? It's a, a big, it'll may have a huge impact.